Brian, and welcome to BattlefieldResumes.com Leadership Podcast, where my twin brother Bruce and I are committed to building better leaders. From webcasts to webinars, podcasts, to personal services, one-on-one coaching, and online opportunities. Remember, the key to success begins with building the leader in you. As part of the John Maxwell team, we want to live out the principles that John teaches. This is our rule of five that we seek to practice every day. To lead, to grow, to create, to excel, and to serve. Please visit us at BattlefieldResumes.com. And remember, make today count. All right, this is Bruce Benedict, and my brother's online with us. Brian, can you say hello? Brian. All right, and we're uh, interviewing uh, Christopher Cooper Sr. today from uh, Vectris Incorporated. Hey, can you say hi real quick, Chris? Hello, everyone. Good to see. Uh, good to be good to be online, and definitely uh, spend some time with you guys and uh, tell you a little bit more about Vectris. All right. Great, uh, let me give great. you a quick uh, overview of. Uh, Chris, for everybody out there, uh, Chris served honorably in the U.S. Marine Corps from 1995 to 1999 as a personnel chief, where he was responsible for approximately 850 personnel service records. Chris has over eight years' experience in IT. He served with CNN, Jackson Public School District, the Salvation Army, Union Pacific Railroad, and IBM. Chris has over six years experience in IT recruiting, serving with all staff technical solutions, universal business solutions, SAGE, CDI talent and technology solutions, and now Vectris Incorporated. He currently serves as a senior technical recruiter for Vectris, which is a leading provider of global service solutions in the areas of infrastructure asset management information technology and network communication services, logistics and supply chain management services. Vectris operates in 15 countries around four continents in both stable and unstable environments, employing approximately 5,000 people and managing more than 7,000 subcontractors. Also, 30% of Vectris's employees reported having a military background and that is why we're talking to Chris today, to give everybody out there an advantage. Battlefield Resume Methodology, we target um, companies. You know, you have to look at the civilian workforce like another battle, like another war. Um, the civilian workforce for in our methodology is the war. It's an unfamiliar environment. You have to become familiar with it, no different and than when you deployed. Uh, you use military doctrine and, te- and methodology to make sense out of the world. And then every job that you apply to is a separate battle, you know. So we're, we look at every different job uh, and the key terrain within every job announcement and every interview. And so if you look at it that way, it makes a little more sense. And then you can apply your background and tailor your background towards it. So today we're going to talk to Chris, um, you know, initially about his experience when he transitioned and also what jobs they have available, what he's seen you know, has worked, and what he has seen hasn't worked, to give everyone out there, all of our listeners, you know, an advantage when they're applying for jobs with Vectris. And so, um, Chris, you know, welcome to the show, and we really appreciate you coming on board with us today. Oh, thank you so much, Bruce. I really appreciate being here with you guys. Well, oh, Chris, man, we love, um, we can love you, having you here, too. That's great. We're glad. Yeah, absolutely. Can you uh, can you just uh, inform everybody, you know, about your background, you know, when you, uh, you know, as you entered the military, you know, and kind of uh, chronologically how you, how you made your way to where you're at today? Most definitely. Well, uh, you know, one thing that really uh, was interesting about me, uh, I actually joined the military at the age of 17, so my mother had to sign for me to go in. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I knew then what I wanted to do, so uh, I definitely wanted to serve my country, and uh, the Marine Corps was definitely calling me. So I, I went 
served my country for four honorable years. And uh, when I got out and began my civilian career, uh, it was really kind of difficult for me to make the transition because I was not only transitioning from overseas back to the States, but uh, what they have now, which is TAPS and Separation Center, wasn't as resourceful back then as it is now. Because now there's a plethora of information, plethora of resources, uh, a lot of things for vets. And then there's guys like you, Bruce, and, and, and your brother with Battlefield Resumes that are putting a lot, a lot more information out there. So back then it wasn't a lot of that information. So I ended up just pretty much going back to my home record of residence and kind of starting out there, you know, going to a training school. And once I finished the training school, uh, I actually relocated to Atlanta, Georgia, just to be a part of more opportunities and have more opportunities available to me. And that was when I made the switch and said, okay, well, I know I want to stick in IT because 99 around that time frame, IT was big and booming, plus the big 2000 was coming in, so everybody was scared. Uh <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it was really easy for me to jump right into CNN after I got a, a couple of my certifications for IT. And uh, once I did that, that is what kind of opened the door to kind of let my career kind of be on cruise control and continue to excel. Uh, but I know nowadays it's not that easy still for uh, veterans to transition. So, you know, that's why I'm glad to be on this call because I can't talk about all 300-plus job openings that we have globally. <laughs> but what I would say, <laughs> what I would say, there are some very, very hot requirements that we have right now. And uh, pretty much right now I'm actually in Reston, Virginia. So I came to the headquarters office and uh, sat down with the, uh, the contracting manager director and there's a position I got right now that's hot off the press, straight from her mouth. I haven't even posted it on the job, uh, on the careers page yet, which which I might add, uh, our career page is www.vectress.com backslash careers. And that's where you can go see any of these jobs that I'll be speaking about, even the one that I'm going to tell you that's not posted because I'll be posting that tonight. Uh, and that's the senior contract admin. And either I'm looking for a level three or a senior person or a lead. Uh, and that's the one that has, you know, background in FAR, TA, cradle to grave contracting uh, type deal, dealing with federal government contracting. So you'll be coming in, being added to our contracting team. And there's a couple of locations for this position. We would prefer someone to be in resting at the headquarters office, but we're open to Huntsville, Alabama as well. Uh, another great position that's actively re uh, we're actively recruiting for is the strategic pricing manager. So we're looking for all those wonderful people with a federal background uh, and federal government background in pricing and, and, and definitely has at least 10 plus years experience. Uh, we would like for you to come in, definitely be a, a, a asset to our, our, our proposal and business development team in composing all pricing for the proposals that we'll be going after. Uh, and it, it is a kind of manager lead role, uh, but you will be reporting to the uh, finance director uh, in Reston, which which is Miss Tina Chow. Uh, another position that would kind of more relate to some of the, you know, I would say probably the enlisted kind of E5 and below type uh, candidates uh, are are afloat engineers, and this is really for the Navy for a program that we do for the Navy. Uh, where we get network engineers, system engineers, and you guys handle all of the IT and technical support for these naval ships that go out to the, you know, out on deployment. So uh, it, I wouldn't, if you're a family man and you're okay with it, and the wife is okay with it, I'm okay with it too. But you'll be gone two to four <laughs> months sometimes. So you know, we would prefer somebody that has no problem with being deployed for a length amount of time and preferably Navy because you're already used to that type of life. Uh, but we'll take all branches on that as long as you have a solid understanding of SATCOM, which is uh, the Naval kind of telecommunication system. Uh, looking at the uh, two great positions that we have down south uh, with our Army Corps of Engineers program, we're looking for some great voice over IP engineers and some Unix engineers. And, of course, that relates completely to, you know, voice over, voice over IP. So it could be uh, Cisco or Via, but we definitely want somebody that has a solid understanding of voice over IP, can do some troubleshooting, definitely is able to handle uh, 
certification, getting the certification as well, because I would like to add that on a lot of these government positions now, the certification levels uh, are changing. Uh, originally for system engineers and network engineers and voice over IP and Unix, the IAT level two certification was required, which is like a security plus or something like that. And uh, that wasn't too strenuous, but they're changing those regulations and the IAT level three certifications will now be required which is going to put you in the direction of either a CISSP or a CASP certification, which is geared more towards security. So I know a lot of my IT folks out that are listening, uh, you know if you're a system engineer and you work on servers, you don't really touch a lot of security or firewall. But moving forward in the federal government, you will have to get familiar with those certifications in order to be applying for a lot of these roles. And that's just not our company. That will be other companies as well. So I uh, just want to put that out there and put that plug out there for everybody to be prepared for that. Uh, and moving forward, Afghanistan, Kuwait, these all, all these positions also require those certifications. And for Afghanistan, we're also looking for some network engineers, network security engineers, and some system engineers. And that's all evolved around IT uh, for our BD or business development people out there and those that want to uh, definitely do it on the federal government side and have a background, we have two openings for capture managers as well. Uh, one would be in Colorado Springs and another would be actually in Reston, Virginia. They're, we're actively interviewing for those as well. So all of these positions uh, we're actively interviewing for and definitely have an immediate need for it. So the hiring manager is looking to move really quick on these roles. So definitely, again, go to www.vectris.com backslash careers. All of these positions will be listed, and it notifies or lets me know, and I can uh, look at your application and forward it on to the hiring manager. Wow, that is that is awesome, Chris. That is, that is just amazing. Um, yeah. You know, th you were talking about the different certifications. Have you seen some of the certifications that, um, that you know, people should have, um, you know, that they should, they should obtain. I mean, you, you talked about the CISSP, the CASP, and then, um, you know, within the federal contracting, you see a trend in the future. So if somebody's trying, you know, maybe a year out, two years out, they can get ahead of the curve. Oh yeah. Most where they maybe should focus uh, in right now. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Because uh, uh, the one big thing about the CISSP and the CASP, most IT people, unless your background is in IT security or network security, you won't even pursue those certifications anyway. But if that's the only one that you would have to take, you still have to acquire what they call the computing environment certification. So those are required as well. Now, most people, uh, if you want to get a head start or a jump start, usually if you're a Unix person, you want to start looking at some Unix or Linux certifications. So more certifications geared towards your actual skill set. And that would put you ahead of the curve as well because you have to have those as well. So, you know, definitely want to look at Security Plus, uh, Network Plus, MCSE, MCSA, all of these type of certifications that will definitely get you ahead of the curve. And those are trending that would help you no matter if it's federal government or civilian positions. So those certifications you definitely want to get ahead of. And uh, I definitely want to tell people to look at those and, and try not to do those boot camps. Uh, uh, a lot of those boot camps are out there that will get you a certification like within a weekend. Well, yeah, you're definitely passing the test, but you will not pass the interview. So uh, <laughs> none of that information will retain in your head. Chris, can you – can you expand on that? So let's say um, you're you're interviewing someone who maybe has gone through the boot camp versus another applicant who hasn't. What types of questions are they more technical questions than sitting behind the, you know, on the interview panel? You know, so if, if I go in and I'm a boot camp graduate versus a, a regular certified person, and I go into an interview, the mere fact that I have the certification and that's stamped on my resume and that I tell you I have a certification, how, how do you vet that in an interview? Well, they would definitely dive into the actual software that you would be touching or the, 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 the platform that you would be working on. So let's say that you are a Unix or Linux certified person. Uh, well, they're going to get into scripts and uh, commands and things that you should know that are very basic 
that would be some things that you would actually go through on an entry level position. And those are the type of questions that they would use to vet you because people that do the boot camps where you're just answering questions, you're going through material. Uh, a lot of that information doesn't retain or stick in your head. Uh, some people are different. Some people are not. I won't say that everybody does a boot camp is not successful because there are some successful people that do the boot camps, but they've also had a little bit of an IT background before they did the boot camp. So I would definitely say if you're going to do the boot camp, at least go back, brush up on the terminology, get you some uh, get you some older equipment in your home and start practicing. You know, go back over that information because – Every technical interview that you have moving forward, they're going to dive into certain scenarios. And they're going to, it's not really a right or wrong answer. It's more of a methodology answer. They want to see what steps you would take to get to the resolution of whatever that issue is. Because there's multiple ways to fix a lot of things in IT, but there's certain routes that would be better in order to uh, move forward. So, you know, that's the one thing that you got to get familiarized with is, you know, the actual steps and in-depth processes of each platform or software or equipment that you will be supporting. You know, uh, IT is just, it's booming right now. And actually there's a shortage of IT guys around the country, I believe, and, and uh, just programmers. Um, and, uh, I mean, there's, there's apps on everything. Um, and you mentioned a couple of uh, things like Linux and stuff. Is there is probably a hundred different languages out there of programming yeah. language? Is there any one or two or three that's more specific? Uh, you had mentioned, I believe, a couple of them, um, but uh, you know, just like your cell phones, those you know, you, you, there's Android, there's Apple, you know, and those are different programming languages. So right, um, that's what I was just I was just kind of wondering what what do they really specifically need to uh, learn to do to work in some of these uh, jobs and these careers that you have listed here? Okay. Well, I'll definitely say on uh, that from a vector standpoint, not a lot of programming positions that I have seen or worked on. Uh, the ones that I have worked on, there's a lot of proprietary software. So it's not okay. that it's not something that you can go buy off the shelf or a company can sell it to us. But we would actually buy a software and it has a back office or a, uh, the back the back coding is built off of something that might be foundation a uh, foundation of everything that somebody might know, which was like uh, one is uh, UPass. So it's built off of C sharp or C plus plus. So anybody right. that has that type of background would be able to come into this position and pick up programming on this actual software, even though it's not fully C++ or C Sharp, it's built off right. of the same logic. So somebody that understands it can pick it up quicker. So you have those type of positions out there as well when you're dealing with right. with the programming size. Well, uh, let me ask you something. Could they, like, if, if there was a programmer out there that, that uh, you know, here in, in, the, in the Midwest, I'm in the Midwest, and you're here in the Midwest in Indiana, in Carmel, there's a, uh, you know, there's a place that they, that, you know, they they um, educate these guys. It's kind of like in Seattle, and um, you know, they they educate these guys on programming languages. Um, if some of those guys are are uh, proficient and pretty much, I mean, they probably have to be experts to work in some of these fields. Especially, I mean, what what you have listed over here is is pretty good. Um, but if they have questions, they can contact you or the company and, and see or go to the website and see if there's any job uh, that's available for them. Most definitely, most definitely. And and don't be uh, – don't limit yourself. I mean, if you have a minor programming experience or a minor IT experience, still reach out because we have positions that go as low as PC tech and uh, system admin. So, you know, those are entry-level positions that, you know, you can get into and get your foot in the door. And one thing about Vectors that I can tell you, they definitely promote within. So, I mean, I'm a, I'm a success of that because I've been promoted twice uh, over this last little, over the last year or so. So, I mean, I'm doing something right, and they, and they appreciate right. that, and right. they reward you for that. So There's so, there's so many high-tech jobs out there, and, and – uh, and as we were talking before, a lot of the acronyms that, uh, you know, you and Bruce are used to, I'm sitting out, even though I, I mean, I got out, I got out <laughs> of the army in 91 and, and some of the acronyms you're throwing out, I'm going, holy cow, I'm, I'm way out of base here. 
And, and uh, <laughs> but you know what's what's interesting is that uh, as high tech as it can get, um, what's interesting is I, I've been going through the job search, and um, it's it's kind of cool to see welder and electricians, uh, firefighters, fire inspectors, yes. um, lounge cashier, shuttle bus yes. driver, uh, HVAC tech. I mean, it's uh-huh. it's. It's pretty cool because it, it really is more than just the high tech. Um, it's just like you handle a specific part, and there's other guys that handle specific jobs, I would imagine. But if anyone has, you know, any skills, to, to feel free to contact Vectris and find out, hey, is there an opening somewhere in the world for me? Exactly. That's exactly what I definitely want to get across. And it's actually – Pretty awesome because as you read off my background, I've worked with some great companies. A lot of those companies post jobs. They're not even active. Uh, I will say that uh, a lot of this 300-plus positions on our on our career page are active positions. We're actively looking for those people. So it's a right. good thing. It's, you know, if it's not on there, then that means, you know, it's filled and it's gone. But if it's on there, we're definitely looking for it. And it's it's a good thing to go ahead and apply because – and don't limit yourself. You know, if you if you see another position, I mean, I've seen candidates in there that have, I don't know what they were doing that day, but they sat down and applied to like 14 positions at one time. So, <laughs> 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 but uh, it, 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 it opens up the doors because they were all positions ranging from different things, but he had a military right. background. And one thing I want to point out to the veterans, do not limit yourself because you guys are uh, broadened with skills because you do so many different things in the military. I mean, I was a personnel chief, but I work with the IT team sometimes. I work with uh, the database team sometimes, uh, reporting, uh, stuff like that. So, you know, I I was able to translate all of that into my resume. You know, everything that you do is, is, is worth putting in your resume, but to a point to where you're specific about it. Specific about that skill. Don't don't be so broad and say, well, yeah, I've worked on telephones. No, what type of telephone systems? You know, Avaya, Cisco. Be those specific. Remember the the series of the equipment that you're working on. So if you have a model number on some equipment, just put that in a mental note somewhere or write it down somewhere on your resume because the type of equipment and series of equipment and levels that you are and stuff that you're touching, that matters to hiring managers. They want to know because they're buying some of that same equipment. So if you already have experience, of course you're going to be a plus. But if they don't see it in your resume, they, they won't even know it. Yeah, that's great. Hey, Chris. I that's have, great. Uh, I got a question for you. The um, You know, you were mentioning level three. You have a lot of level threes available. And when you go on the website, there, there, a lot of people may not understand the difference between the levels. Uh, okay. Could you explain a little bit about that to vets who are not familiar with level one, two, and three, or junior, mid, and senior? Right. So level one is usually your entry level. I mean, you're looking at someone that uh, they're familiar with the terminology, but fast learners, and they can come in and kind of pick it up. Now, that won't usually be a lot of the IT positions because there's so many specific type of equipment that you have to touch on the IT side, but a lot of our other positions and the logistics and facilities and uh, back office, admin, support, all of those positions, yeah, you can definitely come in with under a year of experience and have a good career, great compensation. We have a good benefits package, and I think that it's it's, it's a really good level to be at for somebody fresh transitioning out the military. Uh, A level two, uh, that's probably your E5 up to E7, you know, uh, or excuse me, E3 to about E5 because you're looking at somebody now that has probably about two to three years experience, in whatever that position is that they're applying for, uh, they, they, they have the, the, the mental capacity to be able to jump right in and kind of just get brought up to speed on the certain processes of the company, but they understand the formality of what they're supposed to be doing because they've done it before. Uh, level three, you're talking about five plus years experience, or uh, five to about five to about seven or eight years experience. Uh, now that's when the compensation starts changing for you. It gets a little bit better there. Uh, but those level three positions, you're usually 
you're not like uh, in charge of anyone, but like you're that go-to person for the uh, technical aspect of whatever that job is. So, you know, from a PC tech standpoint, they would go to a PC3 or a PC tech 3 because that person kind of has done a lot of the troubleshooting and things of that nature that they're dealing with. Uh, from a senior standpoint, uh, that's the person that's kind of outlaying, hey, this is what's going to be done. This is what we're going to work on. And you're still kind of getting your hands dirty doing some of the hands-on. So you're kind of at that level, you're like eight years or more experience, eight, eight to about 10 years experience, uh, and you're not fully off of the hands-on, but you're still kind of getting your hands-on, but on also some of the uh, of the supervisory roles. Uh, and then as far as the lead, I mean, that's the uh, that's, that's really kind of the top of, well, I would say the NCO. So that's your first sergeant, your master sergeants, things of that nature. So that's the person that, you know, he'd probably be in charge of kind of doing some evaluations or performance evaluations, uh, also very knowledgeable in the skills of whatever that job is. So he is the, you know, the last go-to type person. So you got, when as those levels go up, so does your responsibility and knowledge and capabilities of what you can bring to the team goes up. But on the bottom at the entry level, it's a great way to get in and understand and build yourself. So, you know, know what you're going in for. So if you know you don't have any experience in voice of RIP, definitely don't waste your time or the hiring manager's time because our application can be <laughs> very detailed. So don't waste your time filling out that application right. for a lead role when you never touched anything. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it's interesting, too, because the, uh, you know, the level three, the subject matter expert, and the senior, those are our higher-paying jobs. And, you know, right. a lot of transitioning veterans, a lot of military transitioning um, personnel really want to obtain those high-paying jobs. And that's great, but sometimes there's, a, there, there's another strategy that says get in when you, wherever you can, even if it's at a lower uh, uh, salary level, because you have the drive and initiative and work ethic that the company needs and you will get promoted, um, you know, uh, faster than others who don't have that same background. Is that is that how you see it? Uh, what's the strategy that you would recommend? Well, I, I definitely uh, – I, I used to be a, a believer in that strategy until, you know, uh, I had already been out for a while, and then I looked back over. I was like, man, if I would just went for what I wanted as soon as I came out, I probably wouldn't have had to build up like I did, but – uh, the, the the true strategy is, especially when you're talking about uh, level three on up to lead, uh, yeah. these uh, candidates or potential employee, employees that are looking at those roles, they should definitely not have that strategy of get in where you fit in. Because if you're already applying for that, that means you have already previous experience in this role. So the best yeah. thing for you to do is go to salary.com and already salary.com and already see what the industry and the level uh, of that position is paying right now. Uh, and I'm glad that you brought that up because that is a good point that I've, I, I've realized about a lot of good veterans that are coming out. They have solid experience, solid background, but they're undercutting themselves because they want to get the chance to get in. So they're giving out these low compensations. Uh Mm -hmm. Definitely go in with a fair compensation because you're telling not only yourself that you're worthy of it, but you're telling the hiring manager, hey, I feel I'm worthy of it. And then what determines yeah. if you are, if you're not, is what you say in that interview. So uh, that's where, you know, but always go in, definitely go in with the confidence of who you are and what you know, because that says a lot to the hiring manager. A lot of vets come to me, they have, you know, years of experience, whether you, whether you've been in, you know, five years, 10 years, 20 years, you just, you know, a lot of these guys have a lot of experience. Um, the frustration comes when they can't, they know they are qualified for the job they're looking at, but they can't get any feedback from a recruiter, let's say. They can't get the interview because they know once right. they get in the interview, they can answer all the questions. What's the secret? What 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 do you say is the best strategy for someone who, if they see a level three position on your website, 
they're trying to uh, formulate their resume. What should they do? How should they put their certification so you recognize it or somebody who's unfamiliar with IT recognizes it and knows that this person deserves an interview? What's your recommendation okay. for that? My recommendation, and I, I actually, uh, if anyone goes to my LinkedIn profile, I actually wrote a, a post on this about resume customization. Uh, and really, for those type of potential employees, what you should do. Now, most job requirements, if you look at a job requirement, there's a position summary, and there's just paragraph of either the company or the position itself as a whole, what your job duties would be. And then there's a section where it says minimum qualifications. And then there's like all these bullets of things that are in these minimum qualifications. That's where you need to put your focus, on the minimum qualifications. So if the minimum qualifications is five years experience with a bachelor's degree, must have experience with this software, that software, and have federal government experience as well. If those are the minimum qualifications, those are the things you need to focus on and highlight in your resume. And when I say highlight in your resume, I don't mean, oh, well, I did it like seven years ago. No, you need to find somewhere where you can put that within your last three positions. Because I'm telling you right now, if you have a resume that's two pages or more, it takes a hiring manager seven to 10 seconds to look at a resume. And if you're not getting it all to them on that first page, they're not even going to go to the second page anyway. So you need to make sure that you're putting those key points or key words, as I call them, somewhere in the first page on your recent, most three recent positions, you have at least needed to do the minimum qualifications. Yeah. That's, I mean, that, that, it just makes sense to do that. I mean, it's, it's yeah. you know, it, you, you, <laughs> yeah. uh, you're, you know, you're catering your, your resume and Bruce, you, I mean, you do resumes quite a bit. I mean, you, and I'm sure you agree with it. Yeah. I always tell everybody that the top half of your first page is the most critical piece of land you could ever have. And when somebody brings a, um, you know, and let me know what, what you think, uh, Chris. When somebody brings a resume to me, then, and they say, hey, you know, can you look at my resume? The first question I ask is, give me the job announcement that you're applying to. Because I'm mm -hmm. going to look at the minimum qualifications, and then I'm going to take their resume and fold it in half and hopefully all of the minimum qualifications are in the top half of the resume. Exactly. If so, then I'll probably look further, right? And so um, you really have to know what you want to do before you apply uh, instead of an autobiography, right? Um, right. Now, I have a question too, though, is, um, you know, I call it dead space or, or you know, dead time. What Time within your resume, experience that doesn't relate, experience you cannot tailor to the job you're applying to. Is it relant to put that in your resume or not? What's your take on it's, that, Chris? It's definitely relevant to put it in your resume because hiring managers, recruiters, uh, we do look at dates. So if there's a gap, that's going to be the first question that comes up. Why is that gap there? Uh, so it's better to put it in your resume. But what I always tell my candidates, uh, don't be as detailed about what that gap was. Oh, I took some time off to travel around the world, and I did this, and I did that. No, <laughs> just sabbatical from this day to that day. <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, yeah, family emergency this date to that date are, you know, helping, you know, just don't get too, or if you open a business, I had some that, you know, were entrepreneurs for about five to six years, uh, and they wanted to come back to the workforce. Well, just, you know, mm -hmm. entrepreneur dates from this yeah. time to that time. Now, if it relates, if the if what you were doing while you were in that gap, let's say you were an independent consultant, uh, and, you know, of course, as an independent consultant, you don't have clients like back to back to back and you're making big money because if you did, you wouldn't be coming back to the workforce. Uh, so, you know, but the hiring managers don't know that. They just know that, hey, well, he was a tech writer uh, while he was independent during this time, and he actually had some, can some uh, clients at this time. That's where you need to be detailed because it relates to the actual skills and it relates to what you're going for. But if it doesn't relate to the skills or what you're going for, be very simple, very sweet, and just show what that gap dates were. 
So to sum up the resume piece of it, can you give us some of the some of the problems that you've seen and some of the advice that you would give on submitting a resume and then how to get a response back? Because that's one of the most frustrating pieces for everyone that I talk to is they'll submit yeah. hundreds and hundreds of resumes but no response. So if can you can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. Uh definitely. And on the resume portion, the only thing that I can say that I've seen that would definitely uh not be as benefit as a benefit to the candidate is putting all of it in the resume as far as the awards and everything, letters, references, all that's in the resume. No, there should be separate documents. So the resume mm -hmm. only speaks on professional work experience and background that relate to your professionalism uh, or, or whatever you're going for. Then you should have a separate yeah. document that you don't, you don't have to send with your resume, only if they ask for references. Now you can put in all the rest of that stuff, the page that you have with all your awards, any references that you have and their contact information, any other letter of recommendation or anything like that. Now you can send all that up. Uh, the good thing about a lot of HR systems now, you can upload multiple documents. So, you know, it's good to upload all those documents at one time, but identify them as what they are, you know, resume, references, letter of recommendation, mm -hmm. because when you upload them, it takes the file that you have saved and put it in there. So we see something that, that doesn't look like a good file or doesn't look like a good application process and put together and packaged up, it will be, you know, disqualified, and it could be rejected. Absolutely. Uh, it's all about the presentation. You only get one chance. And if I'm telling you, you got seven to ten seconds to sell yourself, you better do it right the first time around. Uh, so as far as getting feedback, now, of course, I've been on both sides. I've been a contractor and I've been a recruiter. So uh, I do bring a lot to this, this portion uh, because I've seen both sides. So I have been that employee or a potential candidate that just applied to all these great positions, didn't hear nothing back, went to job fair, shook my hand, mouth dry as I don't know what, but still no feedback. Uh, and then when I turned over to the recruiting, changed over to the recruiting side, I saw why. I mean, most recruiters can have upwards of 10 to 30 requir job requirements, one recruiter. So you have to realize you're doing everything on those requirements. And these are no excuses, but just reality. So you have to do everything on those requirements. You have to make sure that all candidates are being looked at. They're being the ones that are getting interviewed, they're getting interviewed. The ones that are not being interviewed but seem like good candidates, you gotta make sure you're putting them where they're supposed to go so that they can be seen to uh get selected. So never think that no candidate is good. All recruiters try to use every candidate that comes in because if we can't get you on the position that you apply for, it is our duty to look and see what other positions you are fit for and put you on those roles as well. And that's how we do it at Vectris because we have so many openings, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to get to every applicant. But for those that we don't get to, we always do circle back and look at old requirements where people applied or a uh, pipeline of candidates that we have. But the key trick is consistency. Uh, I wouldn't say blow up the HR phone, but I would say use your resources. LinkedIn is a very good resource nowadays. Um, there are, you know, people who have their company and their title on there. So if you're looking to uh, try to get in, definitely reach out to me, 678-699-8163, uh, or reach me on my email, chris.cooper at vectris.com. And uh, at the same time, you can look at LinkedIn, and there's other people in Vectris that you can kind of reach out to. To be honest with you, that's actually how I got my position because I saw the opening. I went and looked at another recruiter, contacted that recruiter, and said, hey, I saw that you guys got an opening. Here's my resume, and I think I'd be a great asset to the team, and left it at that. Now, I don't bug that person. I just do it one time, maybe one or two times, once to say who I am and another one to follow up and leave it at that. Uh, when, you, when you're too consistent, it kind of, you know, throws them off. But if you're consistent enough to where you're just showing interest and you're reaching out to certain people, definitely. Uh, definitely would, that would definitely be the route to take. And that's the strategy that I suggest. Uh, it's, it's going to always have that, 
you know, some companies are just too big. They don't get to every applicant. I can't speak about those companies. I know at Vectris we try to get to every applicant. And if you don't have feedback, definitely reach out to me. I'll see what a position that is that you apply to and find out what's going on with it. Uh, and that's 678-699-8163. That's great, Chris. You know, um, one, one thing, too, is if somebody's applied to a job on your website, mm-hmm. let's say three mm-hmm. months ago, and okay. hasn't heard anything back, um, when you or your other coworkers, your recruiters, try to find an applicant for certain jobs, when you actually query for applicants, how far back do you query? And is it recommended that applicants go in and update their profile every couple of weeks so they may come up on the front of your query? Very good point. Uh, I would say definitely go in and update your profiles on whatever HR system you in, you're in uh, that you want to be a part of that company because uh, contact information, email addresses, uh, when we do have new positions and we do those queries, we do send uh, emails directly out to all of the ones that were fitting within that query, and we can go back as far as we want. Uh, so it's it's not a issue of how far back we want to go. It's just usually sometimes how far back does that particular recruiter want to go. Usually I'll go back 90 days, um, and that, that, that kind of wraps up. You know, all the people that I know probably are still actively looking. Anything that's over 90 days, they're probably not actively looking anymore, but they will be open to a conversation. So, you know, you have to be mindful of that and stay active and stay up to date in HR systems. I mean, we, we, we live and die by those HR systems. So when it comes to the candidates, we go in there and we look and, and that's our bread and butter. So, you know, we, we, we touch that first before we look at any new resumes that apply on job boards or anything like that. The ones that come in through the HR system are the ones that we go for first. That's yeah, you know, uh, Chris is Brian uh, over <laughs> this time uh, over in Indiana here. So I, I want to ask you a question about, um, you know, I'm just kind of thinking uh, from my own perspective. Um, and uh, w- when I left the service, you know, you fly mm-hmm. back. I flew back to, um, I think it was Dulles, and then get off the plane. And uh, amazingly, there wasn't any, you know, celebration when I left the service, but uh, uh, no no pipes and drums or anything like that, and you just kind of walk away and you're like, okay, now what? Um, so, but nowadays it's really good that you have this transitioning process. But one of the one of the things that uh, we have, you know, there's so many veterans out there um, that have been out, maybe been out of the service for a couple of years. They went to their hometown. There's nothing there, and they're looking for something. And I guess my question is. is is one of the, you know, I'm looking at the map on Vectris of all the locations you guys are in, and um, it is spread all across the world. Uh, My question is, if, say you, uh, say they're speaking to you about a a particular job, and um, the guy gets an interview, Mm -hmm. uh, where is he interviewing at? For that, say it's a job, and say he's in, Nebraska, and he's he's applying for a job that's in Florida. Is he going to be flying to Florida for an interview, or the if it's a job in actually, overseas? How's that? How's that work? Yeah, the only the only ones that we would actually truly fly out because we would need to do a face to face is maybe our leadership or our executive roles that we may have on there. Other roles okay. that are like mid level or senior level or entry level. We're op- we definitely do phone interviews, uh, and it's usually a conference bridge. Uh, there's probably the first line in our first interview with the direct manager, and then there's probably a second interview with the program manager. So, uh, uh, or vice versa. You know, it could be with the program okay. manager first, and that could be the end of it. But it's definitely phone conference interviews. Well, and I think you know sometimes uh, I mean there's I'm sure there's a group of of individuals out there that that are looking for a, you know, a, a position someplace, but they're like, well, how would I, how would I even interview for this thing? You know, um, is it worth me? You know, and they're going through a bunch of things in, in their head. So they, so it keeps them from applying. 
And I, you know, I, I'm just looking at it from from a uh, uh, kind of a a guy that's been out of the service for a couple of years, and and saying, hey, you know, what's that process? And that's that's really good to know because it's uh, you know, for especially the like you said, the lower level, the mid level, you're you're doing some phone interviews, and and um, you know, sometimes you will have to do that, but. It's, it may be later on in the process, I would imagine. So, um, Right. And one thing that I would point out that you brought up uh, within that same point is uh, location. So let's say there is someone in Nebraska that's interviewing for a job in Florida. Well, you know, from a recruiter standpoint, not a hiring manager standpoint, from a recruiter standpoint, they might look at your application and see where your location is and may reject you because you're not even in Florida. So you right. have to be sure to also make sure you fill out the application completely because usually most HR applications, it will ask you, are you open to relocation? You must check yes because that now will let the recruiter know, okay, well, now I know even if he's in Nebraska, he's willing to relocate. So he'll if he applies for this Florida job, that means he's willing to move to, this Florida, to, move to Florida. Right. And if you right. can't put it in the application, definitely put it on your resume somewhere willing to relocate. You know, that those type of things have to come across. You have to remember you're trying to get as much information about you across within seven to ten seconds. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, another thing is, uh, you know, uh, I, I was in Germany for a little while, so um, kind of use that, for instance. Say, say again, a guy from uh, Nebraska is wanting to go to uh, um, somewhere over in Europe that, that uh, has a job offer. Um you know what's the process for that? I'm sure it's going to be a little different than in the states, but um, and then once they get the job, what's the process of getting of uh, getting housing on the economy? Is it just it's all on them, or or what is that process like for someone who doesn't know? Uh, there's a lot uh, involved with the overseas positions. Uh, I okay. have just started working on them. The far, the furthest I've gotten in the process is actually up to the work visa, uh, which I actually don't have to do anything with. I just have to make sure it gets started. Uh, but okay. that's the furthest that I've gotten in that process for overseas positions. So uh, what I would say is definitely if somebody has some questions about that or is interested in how that process would work, hey, give me a call. Uh, I will make sure to get that information uh, tomorrow and already have it readily available uh, for whenever somebody contacts me about it uh, to find out yeah, a little bit I more think about that. that. Yeah, I think the bottom line is you don't know until you call, and and so you yeah. have to call and ask about these positions because, um, it, you know, I always I have a little saying that says don't fear your shadow, you know, you you got to jump sometimes. So, um, and so you gotta you gotta. Call, make that first move to Vectris, ask them about um, the job that you're you're uh, interested in and the process. Don't be don't already think you know the answers when you don't. So exactly. And another thing is don't be mm-hmm. afraid to use your network because it still holds true in twenty sixteen. It's not what right. you know. It's who you know. So a lot of entry-level people that are coming out and you had a staff NCO or officer that you was really connected with in the service, stay in contact with that person because guess what? When you come to the civilian world and that officer comes to the civilian world, what position do you think they're going to get? A management-level position. If you're keeping in contact with them, you're already ahead of the game. (laughs) Right. That's true, yeah. It's networking. Well, you're trying to have somebody refer your character. You know, I mean, boils down is you don't want to, you know, no one wants to refer someone who's going to do a bad job. So the referring your character to the company and, you know, many, many people get hired based on referrals instead of, you know, out of the cold. So it's, uh, yeah, sure. that's yeah. critical. I can tell you right now, we have one program that's very successful at that, and that's that, that naval program, the FSET program. Uh, they are they have now gotten it to the point to where they get numerous referrals, and it comes from the, the employees that are already working on the program because they're happy about what they're doing. 
So they're just going to get other people that they know would also be successful in that environment and also be a good culture fit. See, one thing that we've gotten away from is actually dealing with people. You know, we've gone to technology, and now you can apply to 100 jobs, and you can sit in one location. But they forgot about the old school days, guys, when we had to get out there and shake hands, when we had to get out there and call people, when we had to get out there and make connections. I mean, all of those jobs you talked about, CNN, IBM, all of those were networking positions. All of those were from my network getting out there talking to people. Because I definitely wasn't going to get into IBM, a company that's 80% remote. I wasn't going to get in there just by applying. I wasn't. Right. (laughs) Hey, Chris, um, when uh, when someone actually gets on board to where um, you've accepted their resume uh, through, let's say, a referral um, or online on the the job site, the career page for Vectris, and you call them up for an interview – can you give us some of the, the tips that you have, some of the do's and don'ts uh, for the applicants when, um, when they're in an interview with you or some of the hiring managers? Uh, for me, I would definitely say, and this is for any recruiter that you talk to, uh, your recruiter is your gateway. So you want to be as honest and open with your recruiter as possible. Tell them as much information as possible. Hey, I would definitely love to interview with this job, but I'm taking a vacation in about three weeks. So if we move forward with the offer, you know, uh, I won't be able to start until after that. You know, let them know all of that. All those things need to be done in that conversation. That's why uh, our terminology in recruiting is pre-screen. That's the purpose of the conversation with us. When you're talking to a recruiter, that's, they're supposed to be getting a full work up of who you are, what you're looking for, where you're trying to go, and compensation and everything because that's the one big thing that you never should talk about in an interview is compensation when you're with the hiring manager because one thing that your recruiter should do is already have that conversation with you and kind of take that range, and they they should never take an exact number. Always come up with a range. Never go with an exact number because if you tell a company, hey, I'll take 60, oh, they're going to give you 55. Uh, so uh, you need to have a range. I'm open to taking 55 up to 65. You know, now they have a range. They can't lock you in because you might have an interview with the hiring manager and the recruiters don't know the full duties that a person does daily on every job. We know what the job description tells us, but the hiring manager knows what their full duties are. So when you have that conversation with the hiring manager, now you will be enlightened on what you can really negotiate for because even though the job description says five years' experience, but you're asking me to do something that a seven-year or eight-year person can do, okay, well, that's no negotiation room for you. So you know where you are. You know, you know what you what you what you're facing, what you're up against. So never for one, hold back from your recruiter. Tell them everything. Any crazy detail, anything that you think would be an issue, any feeling I've heard them all. Felonies, misdemeanors, everything. Uh so you know, we have to go through and have all of that open dialogue with our recruiters because they are your gateway. They're gonna be the ones that actually present you to the hiring manager. So just like we were saying Somebody vouching for your character, you want to get it across to your recruiter who that what that character is, because they're going to be the ones that sell you to the hiring managers. Uh, and then, as far as the interview with the hiring managers, the biggest thing for me is know what you're talking about before you say it. Do not do a lot of uh, huh, uh no. You're, you're unsure <laughs> right. about what you're talking about because that's going to definitely turn them off. The second thing is bringing up compensation in that interview uh, because they want to fully focus on who you are, what you bring to the table, and are you a culture fit. Money, we'll deal with that when we decide if you are a fit. So, you know, those are the, 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 the tips that I would definitely give to anyone on interviewing. Recruiters, give it all to them. Hiring managers, hold back a little bit and be confident about what you're saying. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. So, you know, you, uh, you've you interviewed quite a few people over your career. Um, can you give a couple examples? We, ha- we You know, we have about three minutes left. Can you give a couple examples of uh, interviews that could have gone well but didn't and what the problem hmm. was or something they did that caused them not to get a position um, or maybe it's something the other way around. You know, I, uh, sometimes there's, uh, if, if an interview, if an interviewee talks about a lot of different experiences that they had, 
that's a positive thing. If they can only remember one experience, then so the interview panel, a lot of times they've only really done one thing because they can only remember that one, that one experience. So is there, is there any advice like that that you could give to everybody? Yeah, there's probably two examples that I can give that I know are kind of common that people would probably do. Uh, and one, getting too lax in the interview. Uh, I've seen, I've actually seen candidates, you know, there's some hiring managers that will actually do it on purpose. And I'm not saying that happened at breakfast. Uh, it's been over my career. Uh, but they will bring down, I guess, uh, the professionalism of themselves to see if you would break your professionalism. Uh, definitely don't do that. You know, if they go to joke, if the hiring manager's in there joking and laughing, okay, well, you let him joke and laugh. But you stay and remain professional because they're looking at that. Uh, they're paying attention to all of that. Uh, another one is, and I don't know how to say this the right way, uh, mm-hmm. without saying lie. <laughs> I don't want you to lie because uh, I had a candidate was just too brutally honest. Like, he was late to the interview. My, and the manager uh, said, you know, uh, why were you late? Uh, uh, no, that's late. No, no, you're not just late. <laughs> Say traffic or something, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, those simple things. I mean, it, it, it's, it's really it, it's really that simple. Like, it'll be stuff that simple. And the, only, only, the reason that happens is because it might be somebody just getting back into the, the swing of interviewing. So they got to, you know, remember how to get back into that. And I always say it sounds dumb, but I've done it. Practice. You stand in that mirror yeah. and you think about some things that you want to say. You write down some uh, some some questions about the company and you practice saying them uh, in the mirror. I mean that's that stuff really works, people. It really that mirror works. is is a a wonderful tool if it's used. The mirror is a wonderful rehearse, tool. rehearse, rehearse. Isn't that what they always told us? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Right. Hey Chris, we have about forty five seconds to go um can you give us your phone number again give everybody your phone number a good contact for them to reach out to you and then real quick i guess there's about 30 seconds to go the some of the top jobs that you're really looking at right now okay and my contact phone number is 678-699-8163 that is my direct line so you can reach me uh my email address is chris and that's with the c dot Cooper, C O O P E R at Vectris with a V as in Victor, E C T R U S dot com. Uh, that is my direct email address as well. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven definitely active positions. I know that I can get you some interviews for if you are uh, qualified for these roles, and that's the senior contracts admin, strategic pricing manager, afloat engineers, sure lead engineers and voice over IP engineers, Unix engineers, network security engineers, networking engineers, and capture managers. Those are definitely active positions that I know I can immediately get you some interviews for if you are qualified for those roles. Go to the website, vectris.com backslash careers. Look up those positions. Uh, And if you want, definitely email me your name and let me know, hey, Chris, heard you on the podcast. I applied to this particular job, and give me that job number. It'll usually be a three-letter uh, code with following uh, about five or six numeric numbers. So, for example, uh, uh, the captures manager or the pricing manager I know for a fact is VEC two two one uh zero 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 two two one. So I would need that number so I can go directly to that role, look for your application, immediately send you over to the hiring manager. Well well first I'll have a conversation with you, then send you over to the hiring manager. <laughs> Great. All right. That's wonderful. <laughs> All right, Chris, we appreciate it. And uh this has been Battlefield Resumes. Thanks, Chris. Really appreciate doing the interview today. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it, and best of luck to you and all your endeavors, and I love what you guys are doing with Battlefield Resumes. Looking forward to working with you guys again. All right. Great. All right. Have a good evening. All right, guys. Bye. Thank you for listening today. Please visit us at battlefieldresumes.com and find out how to build the business of you. 
Give us some feedback on topics that you'd like to know about. And remember, most of all, make today count.